Welcome to God Answers Prayer. I'm Linda Tiano, your host, and again here today with another story about how God answers prayer in lives. He's no respecter of person. What he does for one person, he will do for you. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verse 10, and in, that's in the Passion Translation, do not yield to fear, for I am always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I am your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every situation. I will hold you firmly with my victorious right hand. You are never too far gone. God is all powerful and can do anything he wants to do. And that includes healing you. This statement is a word to a number of you out there that are watching right now. It was made by Austin Cox, who has personally experienced the life-saving, life-changing power of God. He is here to share his story. We'll be right back after this. Well, welcome back. We're here with Austin Cox. It's so good to have you with us, Austin. So nice to be here. Appreciate so, you for having me. So, um, tell us, tell us about yourself. You're you're from here originally, right? Yeah, I was born in Taos, New Mexico. Oh, okay. Um, I lived there until I was about twelve. I've uh, lived in Los Alamos as well. So, I basically lived in Los Alamos since I was twelve. Besides. Uh, four or five years where I lived in Phoenix. But yeah, native New Mexican, I grew up here. So I've always lived here. So did you grow up in a family of faith? No, I didn't actually. Um, I never grew up going to church. Um, my parents re really never talked to God about me or anything like that. They later said that, you know, I would it would be better for me to find God on my own. Seeing nowadays how things turned out, I think it would have been better if I would have grown up in the church because mm -hmm. then you still have a chance of encountering God and yeah. meeting God and developing a relationship with Him. Yeah, so tell us about your journey to finding God. Well, that was a long and painful <laughs> journey full of a lot of suffering, actually. Um, I guess it all started in my childhood. You know, it wasn't the best. Like I said, it, I didn't grow up in church. There was a lot of trauma that happened to me mm -hmm. when I was a child that ultimately led me to have feelings of just hopelessness, mm -hmm. a lot of self-confidence issues, anxiety, depression. I was also very shy when I was a little kid. So that led me to want to, you know, fit in with the in crowd right. or the cool people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cool people back then, or people that I thought were cool, you know, were doing things like smoking marijuana and drinking, um, using drugs, abusing prescription medication. So you jumped on the bandwagon. Yeah, I would say that started when I was in early elementary school. I started drinking, um, oh smoking. My yeah. Um, going into middle school, I started experimenting with marijuana. By high school, I was, you know, doing cocaine and prescription pills. Pretty much anything that I could get my hands on, I would do. Anything to try to forget my past or numb all the feelings of depression I was having. Mm. Yeah, it was basically, I just wanted to escape from my reality because my reality was very painful. Yeah. And it was something I did not want to live with. I mean, how... How did you navigate going to school doing all of that? That's what ended up ha happening when my life was consumed with drug use and just partying. Uh, school really was put on the back burner. I began to ditch school a lot. Um, I don't think I went much at all during my sophomore year, and that led me to drop out of high school, mm. which intensified my isolation. Yeah. I would isolate myself. And I would just drink and smoke marijuana and use drugs when I win and how I could get them, you know. And it really began a really bad cycle of just isolation and drug use. So your parents really, did they know what was going on? 
Well, drug addiction and alcoholism <laughs> runs in my family. So at the mm. time, my dad was also addicted to drugs, which I did not know at the time, uh. but I found out later on. So at the time, I was living with him. So it wasn't a very good environment. And yeah. my parents, I was kind of left to my own devices. A lot of people I knew were older than myself. I hung out with people that were doing a lot of bad things and drugs. And so my parents really tried to hold me accountable, but there really was nothing they could do because I was so out of control already by the time I was 18. So you didn't grow up with like grandparents or uh, extended family that you could turn to? Um, I actually did. I had gotten arrested, I would say about 10 times before I was the age of 18. Oh my goodness. So I was given a decision. I could go live with my grandparents in Arizona or I could face the juvenile justice system here. So of course I went to live with them. But I think that was also unhealthy just because they were very strict and they didn't let me out of the house. So that kind of <laughs> intensified my isolation. So mm. coming back after that, I just continued the cycle of drug use and hanging out with the wrong people. So what, what changed? Well, this went on for many years until the age I was 26. By the time I was 26, I had been addicted to methamphetamine for about mm. six years. There's not a drug that is out there that I hadn't done. Any drugs that were offered to me, I would do them. I was addicted to, you know, nicotine, alcohol, methamphetamine, prescription medication, you name it. I had anxiety, depression, so. Just, you were a chemical factory. Oh yeah, it was I mean, a, <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course you couldn't have, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so it was pretty rough. So mm. there was a lot of times that I was arrested. Many times I spent time in jail. Um, it just became a vicious cycle of despair. I thought there was no hope. If there was a God, I was mad at him because mm. I thought it was his fault, his fault that I was addicted. Looking back, I see how ridiculous that is and how we have the free will to make our own decisions. So after just being addicted for that many years, um, when you're doing methamphetamine, it's very evil. There's a lot of evil it opens you up to. Mm -hmm. So by the end, I was just surrounded by demons on every side. All the people I was hanging out with were just evil. So many evil things kept happening to me. You know, I've dealt with a lot of physical violence, a lot of dangerous situations, and just a lot of very, very evil things. So it was finally to the, I guess you would say my rock bottom. And this came after just so much pain and suffering since I had been like 12 years old. For some reason, I just knew I had been to rehab before. I had never let God in. I thought I could do it on my own. I was playing my own God and I was never able to get sober without God. Mm -hmm. So I finally hit what rock bottom. And one night I just, for some reason, I dropped to my knees and I said, you know, if there is a God, I need your help, Lord. I just need you to cure me of this addiction. I can't do it on my own. I don't know what else to do anymore. I can't do it by myself. I need you. So if you're really there, I need a miracle or something because I'm going to die. Mm. So it's kind of funny how God answers your prayers sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I was thinking about the fact that growing up without really knowing that even that there, maybe that there is a God or, or acknowledging that really sets you up because then you don't realize that, that you really have an enemy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that just opens the door and yeah. that's the plan. Yeah, it sure does. So when you're not aware of the devil and mm -hmm. all the schemes that he gets you with, you can't defend yourself mm -hmm. because when you're caught up in all the evilness and all that, it just seems like this is a new normal. This is just my life. I'm just meant to suffer. Right. I can never get out of this. But that's not what God says. That's what the devil's telling us. Right? Amen. Amen. So back to my answers, prayers of yeah. God. The next day I was locked up in jail. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying it's kind of funny how he answers prayers sometimes. Yeah. 
<laughs> but this, that was the only way I was going to get sober, and God knew it. So it's really amazing what God can do. So was there a ministry that came into the jail? Yeah, actually, we had a Bible study and also a class called Spiritual Muscle. Because, ah. you know, people are all about working yeah, out their physical yeah, muscle, but what about your spiritual muscle, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, so that really helped me. There's a lot of Bible studies in there. It helped me to really grow my relationship with Jesus. While I was in there, um, the guards used to joke with me that they had never seen somebody so happy to be in jail before. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd always tell them, you don't understand. God answered my prayer and he saved my life, so I cannot not be happy about that. So, <laughs> so how long were you there? Uh, uh, 362 days. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. a lot less than some other people I've known, uh -huh. but that's all it took for me, which was pretty good. So now the, the big, big question, because for a lot of people that happens to them in jail, mm -hmm. but then they walk out and they, they have not, they don't have a place to go, people to meet, Mm -hmm. to hold them accountable. What happened with you? So luckily I was in jail in Los Alamos County, which is um, a very <laughs> drug-free jail for the right. most part. I've okay. been to other jails in New Mexico and they're just flooded with a lot of drugs. So it was a lot easier in that jail to become sober. But I would say if somebody's experiencing that or if you're getting out of rehab or anything, it's really important that you cut everybody out of your life that you've used exactly. with and everything like that. Yeah. So that's what I had to do when I got out. I didn't talk to anybody I used to use with or anybody I used to hang out with. I got all new friends. And a lot of those friends I met at church, I found a church. Also the Celebrate Recovery Ministry that I'm really active in, I know that uh, they have those all over the place. So that is a really integral part of my recovery is that group. So... What did he do for you? I mean, literally. Yeah, God definitely saved my life in every way. He's uh, continued to work on my heart and my mind and just keeps yeah. showing me those little things I can work on. Cause Amen. Get, yeah, getting sober kind of seems like the really most hard part at that time. But after you get sober, it's kind of the other things you got to work on, like, oh, your anxiety or, you know, am I still feeling depressed or... Am I having thoughts or, you know, still right. dealing with, yeah, all, yeah, yeah it keeps still... opening doors of mm -hmm. different sins. So I just keep getting refined by God. You know, you mentioned as a child, the depression and the anxiety. I mean, was there abuse in the home? Yeah, there was a lot of um, like different types of abuse that I suffered while I was a child, you know, and that's usually what leads to a lot of addiction is mm -hmm. childhood trauma. And mm -hmm. you don't realize at the time that all the trauma that happened to you during your childhood right. would cause you to have all these addictions mm -hmm. and stuff later, but it's probably one of the main reasons that a lot of people, including myself, have suffered with addiction. Well, praise God, you know, that, uh, it, it, uh, praise God that he finally got your attention. Yeah, amen <laughs> to that. But, uh, yeah, so what is your heart now for others? My heart for others these days is just to tell them about Jesus and just for them to know that he can change anybody. If he could save me, then he can save anybody. Nobody is too far gone. Nobody's too addicted. Nobody's too sinful. He doesn't care. God can do anything. He can move any mountain there is. So I would just say anybody who's struggling in addictions or any type of anxiety, depression, chemical dependency, mm -hmm. alcoholism. If you let God in, He will, and He can change your life, and I'm living proof of that. He's the only one. Yeah, amen to that. You can't do it on your own. You need God, yeah. at least in my case. Wow. Well, I want to just say to you, those of you watching right now, as you've been listening to Austin, and there, I think there's some of you out there that may be turning on uh, or looking at YouTube or what, however you're viewing us, and you're just like Austin. You're not alone. And God will do a work for you, in you, through you. He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life, and He wants to change your life. Will you give us a call? <clears throat> call us right now. The number's right there on the bottom of the screen. 
We'll be right back after this. So Austin, you're, um, you had written, ever since that faithful day that God answered your prayer, you've not used any alcohol, drugs, or even tobacco. Yes, ma'am. That's awesome. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. I sure appreciate <laughs> it. It's definitely only because of God. <clears throat> so how, you talked about Celebrate Recovery. Tell us about that. So we're a Christ-based 12-step program, and it is similar to AA or Narcotics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. The big difference is our higher power is Jesus. Amen. And that's the only higher power. And we believe through him that you can have healing and you have strength and victory through Jesus. And it's really just a great ministry to be a part of. We meet uh, once a week. There's a whole book we go through. The first uh, step is, of course, denial. So going through the 12 steps, they all have, they're all based on the Beatitudes. Mm. Yeah, so we all go through there. So every step lines up with some part of Scripture. The book of James is really a lot of what we go through in that. But there's all types of Scripture that just pertain to addictions and changing your heart and your mind. And it's really powerful ministry. And I highly recommend anybody struggling with any type of addiction or lustful thinking or anything like that yeah. like it's not just for the top three like pornography drug and alcoholism it's actually for people with anxiety even depression trauma mm. so basically any defects of character or anything you're struggling with mm -hmm. celebrate recovery can help you heal that's, that that's wonderful so as um as you're there, I mean, you're getting ministered to still, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> but you are also being able to minister to others. Um, how has this experience heightened your awareness of other people around you? I mean, you recognize the signs. You can see what people are struggling with a lot of times, correct? Yeah, that is correct, especially here in New Mexico and just in the whole world in general. Addiction, drug use is running crazy. It's everywhere. Many people I used to use with, um, hang out with, they're all dead now. And mm. these are young people in their 20s wow. that died in their 20s. So today, especially with fentanyl and stuff like that, you'd never know when it's going to be your last time. Mm -hmm. You could use a drug and that could be the last time. Wow. So I would just say it's really important to meet Jesus to save yourself from that because these people I know knew that died, they could have had really productive lives. They could have done anything they wanted to. They were great people and they're just possessed by the demons of drug abuse. And it's just That's very the scripture sad. Scripture say that the devil came to steal, kill, kill and, destroy. and destroy. That's absolutely what the drugs are doing these days. So uh, are your parents still alive? Yes, they are. Um, my mom, she never really struggled with any substance abuse or alcoholism or anything like that, but she has her own problems, you know, like we all do. Nobody's perfect. Right. My dad, he's in recovery now from the drugs, um, not fully. <laughs> so, you know, got to show a lot of grace, but I am grateful to my parents for everything they've done but for they me. they see what's happened to you. Yeah, they're very proud of me, so I just continue to try to be a light to them. Yeah. They actually both attend Freedom Church that oh, I go good. to. So, <laughs> yeah, the Lord continues to work on us all. Oh, that's a huge blessing. Yeah, it sure is. Wow. Well, let your light so shine before men. Yeah. 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 So tell us about, I mean, what are you doing uh, work-wise? So right now I'm actually a city bus driver in oh, Los okay. Alamos. So that's actually a perfect job to, you know, spread the gospel, sprinkle no it in where you, here and there. Meet people, yeah. yeah. Get to interact with a lot of people throughout the day, so it's really blessed. That's, that's wonderful because I was just thinking about that. Uh, like, you know, walking, I, I, I was picturing you walking down the street and seeing people and just reaching out to them because the Lord is showing you something about them that you can speak into their lives that will, you know, it, it'll be like, Almost like, you know, somebody shook them and they're like, oh, 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that he's trying to get their attention, but it's in a good way. It's in a way of freedom. Yeah, it sure is. So I try to be a light where I can be, help those in need, just try to spread my story and just let people know yeah. that God can do anything. He can heal you. He could cure your addiction. There is hope. There's a lot of hope found in, in Jesus. So what about the younger people? I mean, you got started as a child. Yes. Um, do you still see that kind of stuff going on around you? Yeah, right. I do, especially, you know, today with social media and everything, uh, drugs and guns and everything, it's really accessible, a lot more accessible than it used to be, I think. Mm. So I think for the younger generations, it's really important for them to have a strong relationship with God. So when the devil does come test them with these drugs and, you know, different types of things that they can resist the yeah. devil. Does Celebrate Recovery ever go into the schools? So there is actually a segment of Celebrate Recovery. I think it's called Launchpad or something uh -huh. like that. We're a small ministry in Los Alamos, so we right. don't have that yet, but yeah. we hope in the future to have that. And it is like a youth group for kids. Uh, we do have something in Los Alamos. It's called Young Life, uh -huh. and that's a pretty right. strong mm -hmm. you know, ministry for adolescents and everything. Right. Yeah. yeah, but I was thinking especially uh, targeting those that may be experimenting or actually using yeah i would uh, say that's how i got started you know just thinking it's cool this you know smoke mm -hmm. joint oh weed's not gateway drug at least for me that's what i said and that proved to definitely be wrong because i would say oh i'm just gonna smoke marijuana my whole life i'll be fine mm -hmm. but yeah no it led me down a dark, dark path and if I could tell any of the kids out there, you know, you don't want to go through years and years of suffering just because you choose to use a drug. So, so for you, um, the legalization of marijuana in the state was probably like a very bad thing. That's actually pretty funny because, you know, when I used to use drug, I'm like, oh, yeah, legalize it, man, you know, whatever. So, but now seeing that it is legalized and seeing how strong marijuana is these days compared to you know oh, when really? i grew up even so i don't think it's good for your developing brain no yeah no. definitely not because i know you can just tell by looking at me i got a little brain damage no? <laughs> <laughs> but um you're funny but i'm so glad that you came and shared your story um and i pray that the lord will continue to open doors for you to minister to people, that he'll show you the greater things that he has for you. Um, he's not through with you, and you know we're all still a work in progress. But he definitely, we we, we want to sometimes want to hide our past, but he's like, I can use that, and I'm going to use it for my glory. Amen. And so, thank you for being willing to share with people. And if you were listening to this today. And you're like, that's me. Call us. Will you give us a call? And we can put you in, in touch with people. Um, perhaps Austin would be willing to even oh, talk to sure. people. Um, you're, not, you're not out there by yourself. And there is hope. So please give us a call. The number's right there on the bottom of the screen. And if you have not said yes to the greatest gift of love ever given, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, say yes today. Let him come and do what for you what he did for Austin. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his everlasting peace. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>